us today for our small series, a collaborative program between the Greater Macon Chamber of Commerce and the SCORE Middle Georgia. Uh, I'm Andrew Egg. I'm the Vice Chair of Membership Engagement here with the, the Macon Chamber. And um, I'm, I'm excited about today's uh, um, series. So let me introduce you to uh, Matt, the, uh, the SCORE uh, leader. So Matt. Yes, I'm Matt McKenna. I'm the volunteer chair of SCORE Middle Georgia. SCORE is a uh, volunteer organization whose mission is to foster vibrant small business communities. So we're really excited and appreciative of the chamber for helping us uh, put on these small business series to help small business in our area uh, deal with a uh, various uh, set of issues. So stay tuned for your, to your email and to the chamber website uh, for other upcoming events. We'll be doing this at least monthly uh, over, over the next year or two. So let us know what kind of topics you'd like to, uh, to hear, hear about. We're really excited, uh, very fortunate today to have uh, Mr. Jonathan Martin with us. Jonathan is an equity partner with Constagi, Brooks Smith and Profit, which is a national, national uh, labor and employment law firm. Uh, prior to going to private practice, you know, Jonathan was uh, a, uh, in the Air Force in the Judge Advocate General Corps and continues to serve our country as a Lieutenant Colonel in the Georgia Air National Guard. So we thank him for that. Uh, Jonathan graduated from the Terry School of Business at Georgia, uh, cum laude, and also from our local Mercer University Law School here, magna cum laude. Uh, he focused his career, his practice on uh, defending companies from on an, in, in employment litigation uh, under various uh, local, state, and federal laws. Uh, so Jonathan is a well-established lawyer here in town, has been recognized as one of the best lawyers in America, which is a represents the top 5% of lawyer. So Jonathan, thank you very much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matt, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. We've got an awful lot to cover and hopefully uh, I will answer more questions uh, than I create confusion. Um, yeah, as Matt mentioned, I'm a management side labor and employment lawyer and that's all I've done for the last 23 years. Prior to that, when I was on active duty, I did both uh, court martial prosecution and the labor and employment law. Now, let me tell you, as a child, I did not plan on being a management side labor and employment lawyer. I'm not sure that any child plans on that sort of behavior. Uh, my original plan uh, was to go out to Hollywood and become a stuntman. Uh, that didn't quite work out. Uh, so I went off to Georgia. Uh, my dad was a career army officer. He had these great visions of me going off to West Point. Um, I realized I would be court martial the first week if I went to West Point. So the compromise we struck was that I would go to Georgia and consider ROTC. Well, I got involved with Air Force ROTC um, and they commissioned me as an Air Force officer when I graduated. Then they gave me a three year delay to go to law school and I came down to Mercer, graduated, passed the bar, called Washington DC, said this Lieutenant Martin, I'm ready to serve my country, pay you back for all this education. You know, what do I do now? And the nice person that I talked to in Washington, they said, we'll send you a packet of information. We want you to fill out this sheet. And this sheet basically lists where do you want to go in the world? I thought, this is great. So I put down Hawaii and Germany and Italy and Spain and Japan and Southern California and Washington and South Florida. And then I waited patiently. And one day I got these very official looking military orders. And where did they send me? Well, you know how this ends. Robbins Air Force Base, Georgia, 17 miles south of where I was standing when I opened up that envelope. And that's how I got in this world. Y'all know the largest industrial employer in the state of Georgia is Robbins Air Force Base. They've got 30,000 manufacturing employees. And many of them are represented by a group called the American Federation of Government Employees. They know all of their rights. A few seem to be a little confused on their obligations, but they've got their rights down. And so we had three full-time labor lawyers that couldn't keep up with the EEO charges and the grievances and the arbitrations and all of the other issues. And I quickly found myself as a management side labor and employment lawyer. And here's what quickly dawned on me. The best service I can provide anybody is to help you stay out of trouble in the first place, rather than charging you hundreds of dollars an hour to clean up some mess that could have been avoided. Education really is the key to avoiding problems. 
Because candidly, whether it's a union organizing campaign, whether it is an OSHA investigation, whether it is an EEO charge, whether it's a class action, frequently the legal issue is a symptom of an underlying leadership problem and an underlying problem with managers who don't quite understand the rules of the road and make innocent mistakes. Um, I see very few people who intentionally break the law. I see lots of poor communication and poor leadership that leads to expensive litigation. And so with that, let's start with a little bit of education and I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see. All right. Hopefully everybody can see this. We've got a pretty aggressive agenda today and I'll go through everything. Anybody is welcome to a copy of my slides. Um, my email address, which should be on this slide, let me give it to you because if you have questions, um, my grandmother used to always say, Jonathan, I can make more money. I can't make any more time. So if you were giving me an hour of your time, I want to make sure that it's valuable. So if you have follow on questions, shoot me an email. It's J Martin, which is J M A R T I N at Constangi. It's right here at the top. C O N S T A N G Y.com. Again, J Martin at Constangi.com. All right, so let's talk a little bit about wrapping up the COVID-19 pandemic. A question that I'm getting a lot of lately is, can I mandate vaccinations for all of my folks? Mm -hmm. Our friends at the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, liberalized some of the laws um, or some of their interpretations of the laws during the pandemic. For example, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you ordinarily cannot conduct a health inquiry um, or a medical examination on one of your employees. What does that mean? Requiring people to give you their temperature before they go into a building is a, believe it or not, it is a medical inquiry. Prior to the pandemic, that was prohibited. You could not do that. But in working with the CDC, they liberalized the guidelines and they allowed that. The EEOC has said, yes, you can mandate vaccinations, but, and here's the but, if somebody has a religious belief that prohibits vaccination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you are required to accommodate their religious beliefs. Likewise, if they have a health condition that keeps them from being vaccinated, then you must accommodate that disability. What does that mean? Well, if somebody says my health is getting in the way of my job, I have a health condition that keeps me from being vaccinated, you are required to engage them in the interactive process. A fancy lawyer's terminology for what do you want me to do about it? And then listen to what they have to say, right? I've seen a lot of that with face masks. You know, you have people who decide they don't want to wear their face masks. Okay, well, can we accommodate you with a face shield? Can we accommodate you by putting you in an office <coughs> where you don't interact with people? The key is this, as employers, you're required to work with your employees. And some folks may go, "What does this law apply to us? And the answer is the ADA and the Civil Rights Act apply to employers who have 15 or more employees. So yes, you can require vaccinations, but you must accommodate religious beliefs and disabilities. The FFCRA, it sunsetted. Um, on the 31st of December, it is no longer mandated. That mandated paid time off and that mandated extended FMLA. You can extend it voluntarily for the tax credit through the 31st of March. I recommend that you talk to your CPA about that. There's, there's currently no regulatory guidance on what the extension means. But when we put our heads together and looked at the statutory text, it appears that you can't piecemeal it. In other words, you can't give people paid time off if they're positive with COVID, but not give them the paid time off if they have a child who is home from Bibb County Schools. All right, what are some other changes? Well, I think remote work is here to stay. Um, I used to give seminars all over the country. I used to travel about 120 days a year. I spent more time 
outside of making than in making. And now I spend a lot of my time on Zoom calls, including doing presentations like this. So remote work, I think, is here to stay for better or for worse. Um, flexible work is in large demand. You need to make sure that you at least consider, and more importantly, that you are sensitive to employees who are demanding flexible work. I'm handling an unfair labor practice charge right now for an employer, and an employee came forward, they answered telephone calls, and the employee came forward and said, hey, we want to work from home. And another employee <coughs> joined in and said, yeah, we want to work from home. And instead of working, they kept on talking about why they want to work from home. Well, what did the supervisor do? Well, the supervisor did what made common sense, which is wrote them both up for not working and complaining about working from home. Here's the problem. They filed a charge with the National Labor Relations Board. See, there's a law out there called the National Labor Relations Act. Yes, it says that your employees have the right to join the Teamsters if they want to, but it's broader than that. Section seven of the NLRA says that all American workers who engage in interstate commerce have the right to engage in protected, concerted activity for their mutual aid and protection. Protected, complaining about working conditions, including I can't work from home. Concerted, more than one acting together. See, management put in writing, you are being disciplined for spending time talking to your employee, talking to your coworkers about your, your, your asserted right to work from home. If it happens again, you will be terminated. I mean, ultimately, I think they put in writing that the employees were disciplined for engaging in protected, concerted activity. We we're going to withdraw that discipline. If two employees walk off the job, if two employees protest about their job conditions, you always need to think PCA and talk to a labor lawyer who understands the National Labor Relations Act. All right, because I'm seeing it come up a lot in employees who are banding together to demand flex schedules uh, and remote work. Right, and obviously employees are demanding a better employer. I'm a big believer in positive uh, employee relations. As I mentioned, usually the lawsuit is a symptom of an underlying problem, um, typically managers who are not sensitive to the needs of the employees. All right. So on January the 20th, President Biden was sworn in as the 46th president. President Biden has made his labor agenda very clear. We'll talk about his initiatives and his appointees in a minute. <clears throat> but we can certainly expect that policies going forward will be very employee friendly, including within the stimulus package, um, more workers rights. What are some things that are in the $1.9 trillion plan? Well, there's funding for vaccination, expanded testing, direct payments to individuals. That's been a real problem for small employers. During the pandemic, I had a number of businesses in the middle Georgia area who said, you know, Jonathan, we can't get our people to come to work because they're making more money sitting at home collecting unemployment. Um, and we had to work through ways to document that a job was available that an employee didn't show up for. I think this idea of paid time off, right? The FFCRA was the first time there was a federally mandated paid leave program. I think they're just dipping their toes in the water. FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, or some of y'all might think the Friday, Monday Leave Act. Well, the FMLA um, has been in effect since 1993. And for those of you who have more than 50 employees, right, you are mandated to give them 12 weeks of unpaid leave for their personal health condition, their serious health condition, or a family member's serious health condition. But I can see now that the federal government has passed at least one law mandating paid sick leave, that that's going to get some traction going forward. Minimum wage is going up. The only question is how much um, and how soon. Uh, but obviously, the talk has been $15 per hour, and a lot of people are already starting to work towards that, knowing it's coming somewhere down the road. All right. So where are we going to see immediate change? Well, executive orders. President Trump um, had lots of executive orders dealing with DACA, 
dealing with contractor diversity. Um, most of the time, if there is an initiative uh, by an administration, they roll it out to government contractors. The Obama administration, on the very first week of the Obama administration, they issued a whole series of executive orders that dealt with what federal contractors could do and couldn't do. We expect a lot of initiatives to start with, if you're a federal contractor, you need to do this. All right, OSHA, they're going to expand OSHA enforcement, enforcement and they are looking at um, one of the big complaints was that OSHA was not aggressive in protecting workers from the uh, coronavirus. DOL, minimum wage is going up. Like I said, it's just a matter of how much um, and how soon. Um, paid FMLA leave, that's on the uh, horizon. Joint employers, uh, a lot of times employers aren't sensitive to the fact that if you are a temporary staffing agency, then you have liability for what happens at the work site. If you are the work site that is hiring a temporary staffing agency, even though they are not on your payroll, even though you don't issue their W-2, if you're telling them what to do for most federal laws, you are a joint employer, meaning you have liability. So if you have an anti-harassment policy, if you have a policy against discrimination, you need to make sure that your temps are aware of the reporting mechanisms. The EEOC, I anticipate both the EEOC and the NLRB to be much more aggressive in the new administration. We'll talk about some of the particulars. As I mentioned, we anticipate that OSHA will be more aggressive. Um, one of President Biden's top priorities was making sure that OSHA tackled the perception that workers were not adequately protected um, from COVID-19. So on January the 1st or 21st, President Biden signed an executive order which ordered OSHA to issue guidance on COVID standards. Um, be sure and monitor the OSHA website um, as these things unfold. Um, OSHA released uh, protecting workers guidance on mitigating and preventing the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. I've handled a number of OSHA complaints prior to this guidance. Make sure you read and follow the guidance. You know, as I mentioned, um, throughout the Trump presidency, OSHA operated with a vacancy at its top leadership post. Um, we anticipate that um, that will be filled rather quickly. Uh, many of President Biden's uh, nominees have been fairly moderate. That's because of the narrow margin in the Senate um, and a rule called the cloture rule, which allows the minority party to filibuster um, appointments that they don't like. Um, so I anticipate that we will have people who have a pro-employee bent, but otherwise will be somewhat moderate. Department of Labor, um, the Biden appointment, for the Secretary of Labor was Boston Mayor Marty Walsh. What's the significant thing from my perspective? Well, he was a union boss, he has been a union member, and he has always been an inherent of organized labor. We can expect the DOL to be very aggressive in favor of organized labor. Having said that, the sky is not falling. My law firm has an office in Boston, and one of the first things we did was reach out to our Boston lawyers to say, what's the real deal with Marty Walsh? And they said, he is pro-employee, he is pro-organized labor, um, he is pro-raising wages, he is pro-looking out for workers, but he understands that none of that is possible if you don't have jobs. So they basically said that he has been pretty reasonable to work with when it comes to lawyers in the Boston area. Um, and uh, so I anticipate that he, while there will be a pro-employee bent, I don't think it's going to be nearly as bad as some people have predicted. As I mentioned, you know, a proposed minimum wage of $15 per hour, they've been talking about that for years. I think now it's going to happen. Um, you know, how big a deal is it going to be? Well, I'll leave that to the economists. But folks, when you're putting together your future budgets, um, at least it's something to think about because I think it's on the horizon. 
Um, they revoked the Trump tip credit rule for those of y'all who are in the restaurant business. Um, also, they revoked the opinion letters and guidance from the Trump administration. Um, and so we anticipate, you know, much like the NLRB, which is undoing everything that the Trump administration and appointees did, we anticipate the same at DOL. Um, obviously, telework is going to be a big issue. We anticipate seeing much more regulation when it comes to telework. Independent contractors. Folks, that is an Achilles heel. Let me tell you Jonathan Martin's rule of thumb. If they do not have a business license, if they are not incorporated, then they are probably not independent contractors. But Jonathan, they just come and clean our office once a week. I would say they may very well be, if you're not writing a check to a business and you're just writing a check to an individual and that individual doesn't clean offices for anybody else, they're probably a part-time employee, not an independent contractor. What are things they look for? They're different tests. The IRS has a test. The NLRB has a test, right? Common law has a test. The U.S. Department of Labor has a test. The Georgia Department of Labor has a test. They're all slightly different, but here are some common things, right? Do they have the right to subcontract? Do they do it for other people? Do they provide their own tools and equipment? Do they assume the risk of profit or loss? Do you have an independent contractor agreement? Are they their own corporation? Do they have their own employer ID number? Do you, most importantly, control when, where, and how the work is completed? I want my house blue. I want my house blue by the end of March. It's worth 2,500 bucks to me, right? And I don't care if they subcontract it to somebody who does it for two grand and the guy pockets $500 for doing nothing but engaging me. Right? I don't care if it's one guy out there every single day with a, paint with a paintbrush and a bucket, or if it's a crew of 30 who knock it out in an afternoon. Right, That's your typical classic independent contractor. When the U.S. Department of Labor comes and does a wage and hour audit, they will look at all of your 1099s. And by the way, for years, DOL and IRS have had a, uh, an agreement to share information if they if they find independent contractors that are misclassified, it would not be a stretch to think that our friends from revenue won't be showing up pretty soon. All right. When in doubt, make them part-time employees. Yeah, John, just a quick question. Is there any uh, uh, employee size uh, application of that? That is, you know, you mentioned some of these rules apply to people with a certain number of employees. We have a lot of pretty small companies, uh, we only have a few employees. So on the independent contract rule, we know, we know a lot of our, our, our folks have tried to use that over time to get around the, the, the employer. So is there any uh, size uh, application of that? Or does that apply to any, even if I'm just a single shingle business and I hire, want to hire somebody to do something for me, does that independent contract rule still apply to me? Um, the, the wage and hour laws apply at $500,000 of annual revenues in interstate commerce. You bought one thing from outside the state of Georgia and you make more than $500,000, that law is going to apply to you. Yep. National Labor Relations Act, a million dollars in revenue and interstate commerce. When it comes to unionizing and the NLRA, um, I can just tell you, the last union campaign I had in Georgia was two years ago. It was down in South Georgia. There were 11 people in the unit. Wow. The entire company had about 13 employees. So, um, yeah, Title VII requires 15 employees. The ADA requires 15 employees. Mm -hmm. The Age Discrimination Act requires 20 employees. The FMLA requires 50 employees. But other laws require interstate commerce and a certain revenue threshold. Good question. Thank you. No, that's a great, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. All right. If you're a federal government contractor, then you are generally required, if you do more than $50,000 worth of business, to have a written affirmative action plan. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Let me give you the high level overview. Um, that the idea of a written affirmative action uh, plan is this. They look at the data from the last census. And they look at the number of people who are eligible um, for and who are available for certain jobs. 
based on gender and race. And then they look at your actual workforce. And does your workforce mirror those people who are available according to the census within a standard deviation or so? And if your executive staff doesn't mirror the people who are available, then you have to have a written plan to try to recruit people, right? Um, and so there's a group called the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs that monitors that. Um, as I mentioned, you'll notice that um, there are a lot of executive orders that apply to federal contractors. Just keep an eye out for that. Monitor the OFCCP's website if you're a federal contractor for developments. EEOC, um, there's a new sheriff in town. The first thing that um, President Biden did was replace the chair. It was Janet Dillon. Um, the EEOC and the NLRB, their leaders identify by political party. They are both openly political entities. So he removed the Republican chair um, and appointed a Democrat as the chair. Also uh, appointed a Democrat as the second in command. The composition is still the same, but obviously the leader drives the agenda. All right, so what should we expect? Well, we should expect more litigation, um, a focus on what they call systemic discrimination. There are two different theories that, um, that they can use. One is called disparate impact. That's a one-on-one -on -one analysis. Jonathan is a 52-year-old Caucasian male. He's tardy three times. He got fired. Maria is a 21-year-old Hispanic female. She's tardy three times. She didn't get fired. You need to articulate a difference between Jonathan and Maria, which by the way, you know, if you've fallen asleep already, wake up. This is important. If you want to avo avoid problems, all you need to know are the first five letters of the alphabet. For those of y'all who need remedial alphabet, here's how it goes. A, B, C, D, E. And here's what it stands for. Always be consistent. Document everything. Always be consistent. Document everything. Employment discrimination law is just a fancy lawyer's word for inconsistent treatment. So can you explain why Jonathan is treated more poorly than Maria? That's a disparate treatment. Disparate impact is a facially neutral policy um, that singles out one group more than another. For example, there was a recent lawsuit. There was an employer and they said, in order to be eligible for our sales staff, you must have less than eight years of sales experience. Well, who's that gonna be? A bunch of 20 year olds and early 30 year olds. And who's that gonna exclude? A bunch of 40 plus year olds. So the lawsuit was um, whether or not you could have a disparate impact um, on an age discrimination. There's going to be a renewed emphasis on workplace harassment. Just It's the Me Too movement versus version 2.0. And now that the U.S. Supreme Court has said that the word gender in Title VII includes sexual orientation, we expect much more aggressive litigation in that area. All right. There's a bill to watch called the Paycheck Fairness Act. Um, and it seeks to do a number of things. Number one, eliminate class action waivers and arbitration agreements. Um, one of the big things over the last 20 years has been an increase in what they call collective actions under the Fair Labor Standards Act. If you're messing up Bubba's pay and Bubba's not getting the overtime he deserves, then everybody like Bubba um, gets to jump into the lawsuit. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic premise. It's a class action. They've got their own rules under the Fair Labor Standards Act called collective actions. But, you know, a lawsuit that's worth $20,000 can easily become a lawsuit worth $2 million because of class actions. There was a law, there was a U.S. Supreme Court decision that came out several years ago where they looked at the dichotomy between the National Labor Relations Act, concerted protected activity, right? And they looked at a law called the Federal Arbitration Act. The NLRB took the position that a class action is concerted activity. Um, some courts agreed, some courts didn't. The US Supreme Court broke the tie. 
And now I've had a lot of clients who have arbitration agreements to avoid class actions. They're looking to undo that Supreme Court case. All right, they're looking at eliminating confidentiality uh, clauses and settlement agreements, um, looking at banning salary uh, inquiries for applicants uh, and some other things that they've had in various state laws like California for years. All right, the bringing an end to harassment by enhancing accountability and rejecting discrimination in the workplace, the HERD Act. Um, what that's, what's that gonna do? They want to uh, expand anti-harassment uh, protections to all working people, even businesses with less than 15 employees. Uh, Matt, back to your point. Um, they would end a tipped minimum wage and there are other things that they are looking to do. Um, but obviously uh, expanding Title VII and ending tip credit, um, banning arbitration clauses, uh, those are all things that, um, you know, that would affect the way we practice law. They also would be looking at lowering the standard for the threshold of liability. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that um, Title VII is not a federal civility code. The conduct must be severe or pervasive to be actionable. They're looking at undoing that line of precedent with the HERD Act. All right, what are some other things? Well, as I mentioned, in Bostock versus Clayton County, the U.S. Supreme Court said um, that sexual orientation is included in the word gender under Title VII. I anticipate much more than that. You need to make sure you update your policies and you update your training to include sexual orientation and gender identity. All right, the National Labor Relations Board. Day one, they started shaking things up. President Biden immediately asked for um, the general counsel, Peter Robb, his uh, resignation and uh, put in a new acting general counsel. What are they going to do? They are going to undo all of the work of the um, Trump and LRB and make it a lot easier for unions to organize. There's also a law out there called the PRO Act. And I'm gonna cover this quickly. I want you to have the overview. Um, but as I mentioned, for those of you who say, I'm too small to worry about unions, think again. If I were a union organizer, I would target small businesses. Why? You target a multinational billion dollar corporation um, and you are looking at unionizing, you know, five, 600 employees. They have the means, the money, and the resources to fight back. Um, a small employer with 15, 20, you know, 30 employees, they don't have the means to fight a full union campaign. Um, and a lot of times, good organizers are targeting small businesses, not large businesses. Why? Because small businesses can't fight back and small businesses need to get a contract signed because they can't afford for protracted collective bargaining litigation. All right, so what does the PRO Act provide? All right, it's called the Protect the Right to Organizing Act and it was introduced during the last legislative term. It passed the House along party lines. Um, the Senate didn't take up the bill. Is it going to pass in the current Senate? I don't know. The answer is probably not because they don't have the 60 votes to call the question. And they've got enough people to filibuster this. But parts of this could sneak into other legislation. Let's talk about it. Number one, they're looking at doing away with right to work states. Right? What does right to work mean? I have people say that all the time. Well, Georgia is a right to work state. Most of the time when people throw that term around, they are confusing it with the doctrine of employment at will. And the doctrine of employment at will holds that um, you, unless you have a written employment contract for a specified term, you're free to leave at any point in time. Hey boss, this isn't working out. Likewise, my boss can come to me and go, hey Jonathan, this ain't working out. There's no cause of action for wrongful termination in Georgia. That is the doctrine of employment at will. Right to work is whether or not you can be required to join a union, required to pay union dues. In non-right to work states, as a condition of your employment, you have to pay the union. As you can imagine, 
unions wind up being much more profitable without right to work laws. They're looking at resurrecting card check organizing. What does that mean? Here's what it basically means. What it means is that um, if you have enough employees that sign a union card, you have a union without a secret ballot election. Well, Jonathan, what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. They use a thing called the Blitz campaign. Most union organizing is kept underground at a union campaign for an employer in middle Georgia. They got 75%, according to the union, the steel workers, they got 75% of the workforce to sign cards before management even knew a union campaign was happening. Now, after the campaign, and once everybody had the right to a secret ballot, they could vote their conscience without undue pressure, the employer won. But the fact of the matter is that card check organizing would be a game changer. The other thing is this, if a union gets voted in, they only get a contract about 50% of the time. Why? Because the union organizers made all these outrageous promises that they can't deliver at the bargaining table and negotiations break down. So they're looking at requiring first contract arbitration. If you don't have a contract within 90 days, a group of government appointed arbitrators now get to restructure your business. I think it's an unconstitutional taking, but you know, someone's going to have to litigate that. That's right. The federal government is going to come in and tell you basically how you have to run your business with your employees through arbitrators. Um, ambush elections during the Obama administration, um, they took the election cycle for a union election from six weeks to as short as 13 days. They have an entire year to work on you and you have less than two weeks to respond. Again, it was a game changer. Um, union success rate and campaign went through the roof. They're looking at independent contractors. They're looking at expanding joint employer liability. They are also looking at abolishing arbitration agreements. Have you seen this theme? I think arbitration agreements are a hot topic and I wouldn't be surprised if that doesn't sneak into some sort of legislation. They're looking at allowing quickie strikes. The law for you know 80 years has been um, that if you are going to strike, you've got to have some skin in the game. In other words, you've got to walk off the job, right? A quickie or an intermittent strike is where an employee goes, I'm going to work for a little while, well, I'm going to stop. And before management can do anything, I'm going to work for a little while, I'm going to stop. And all of a sudden, your productivity goes from 100% to 60%, and there's nothing you can do about it. Under current law, they basically, it's like baseball. You get three, you get three quickie strikes, and then you're out as a general rule of thumb. They're looking at uh, you know, allowing quickie strikes, allowing secondary boycotts, and I'll go through some of that. As I mentioned, you know, the 28 states that are right to work, including Georgia, the PRO Act seeks to eliminate that. If it passes, if you have a union in Georgia, all workers in the bargaining unit must pay for representation, otherwise they lose their job. Card check, as I mentioned, the stealth card check uh, process, um, the, the so-called blitz campaign. I mean, it's pretty easy. You know, there was a Greek philosopher, his name was Pareto, and he came up with the 80-20 rule. 20% of your people are causing 80% of your headaches. 20% of your people are doing 80% of your heavy lifting. The 20 percenters, they'll sign a card right off the bat. And then they'll go for the free beer and barbecue crowd. Hey, show up and all you got to do is sign a sign-in sheet, which is actually a union authorization uh, petition. Um, and they'll get some more. And then they'll start targeting people in the parking lot. Matt, right, are you with us or are you against us? We know where you live. We know where your kids go to school. And then we get him to sign a card through peer pressure. We get 50% of the workforce to sign a card. You have a union without an election. Um, that was very controversial years ago in a, in a law called the Employee Free Choice Act, but it's making a comeback. First contract arbitration, you have to begin bargaining within 10 days of the request. If you don't have a contract within 90 days, then it goes to a panel of three arbitrators who set your new wages. They look at your size and shape. They look at the employee cost of living. They look at the employee's ability to sustain themselves. And here's the kicker. They look at wages and benefits that other employer, employers have. In other words, right, one of the biggest attention getters in a union campaign 
is the idea that management can propose lower wages and collective bargaining, right? Um, and what gets people's attention is your wages could go down. Under this, I think the answer is really going to be, if this comes through, your wages are never going to go down, but three judges could make your wages go up. What do you have to lose by signing a union card and voting in a union? Ambush elections, as I mentioned, they took the election cycle from six weeks to 13 days, um, which has made it very difficult. I have clients who are engaged in basically uh, perpetual campaigns because they know they're being targeted by the steel workers, auto workers, whomever. Independent contractors, as I mentioned, you know, everyone has a different test. Every government agency really has a motive for independent contractors to be classified as employees. If you don't write a check to a company, they're probably not an independent contractor. Hey, Jonathan, just a quick, we had a quick question uh, on that one. If uh, somebody has been using uh, 1099 employees for, for say several years, uh, can, can, and, and if somebody, the labor folks or the IRS come in and decide that they really should have been uh, employees, can they go after that retroactively? Or is it just from the point in time in which they come in and make that determination from that point forward that, you ha that you're then obligated to treat them as employees? Well, I, I'm not a tax lawyer, so I can't speak to the IRS and Georgia Department of uh, Revenue, um, you know, uh, how that's going to work. I think common sense tells us that they've got the right to go back several years. If they think that you were supposed to be taking taxes and withholding taxes, um, they've got the right to issue fines and penalties for your failure to do so. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the law, the big, the big issue is if somebody is now deemed an employee, say, let's say for wage and hour law, then yeah, you could have liability for back wages for up to three years mm -hmm. and overtime for up to three years. So, you know, take a look at that issue, talk to your lawyer about it. Um, and maybe start coming up with a plan to have them converted to employees going sometime, you're going forward sometime in the future. Um, you need to talk to your lawyer, you need to come up with a business plan to sell the employees on that idea because you're going to, I mean, let's face it, employees like getting paid without taxes being withheld. <laughs> so you've got to figure out how to sell that. Um, but if you've got a lot of 1099s, one or two, um, maybe if you've got a majority, then it's probably time to talk to your accountant and talk to your tax lawyer and talk to your labor lawyer. Arbitration right. agreements. Jonathan, I think I've beat. Yes. It, uh, on that same topic, um, what about uh, hiring uh, employees on uh, when it, on the onboarding process? Um, you know, if you hire them as a contractor, then convert them over to an employee. Uh, what would be the alternative? You know, you hire them as a contractor, so that way, I mean, you're not paying sales to their, their payroll tax, but you're also, you can let them go at any time. What would be the alternative to doing that? Well, I mean, I think you've got two options. Either they're an employee or they're, like, they're an To where they had like... Okay. Is there, I mean, there's no like a training period where they're, um, where they don't have necessarily where you can withhold employee rights, um, you know, on the first 30 or 60 days as, as they train? Well, all right, so that's a complicated area of the law, but let me give you just sort of the, the short answer. Um, your 30, 60, 90 day introductory period is legally meaningless. Um, they have the rights on day one that they have the rights on day 1001. Now, psychologically, mm -hmm. it's very important. And I'm a big fan of training periods. Why? Because it gives you a chance to evaluate them. But employers need to use those, you know, they, they need to use those um, introductory periods wisely. So, for example, here's what I encourage my clients to do. At the end, every Friday before quitting time, the supervisor sits the new employee down and says, hey, Matt, here are three things you did well this week. This, this, and this. Matt, here are three things you need to work on. This, this, and this. If at the end of 90 days, right, we keep on covering the same, Matt, you need to work on this, this, and this. 
it makes it very easy for me to go, Matt, you're a great guy. I think the world of you. I think you're going to be tremendously successful in life, but it's probably dawned on you. We keep on having the same three problems. The Jonathan Martin company isn't the place for you, right? And then Matt's probably going to go away and not think, you know, ooh, one call, that's all. So, I mean, that's, that's really the importance. But legally, an introductory period is meaningless. It does not provide you with any legal protection, although it does provide you with a pretty good tool for vetting people out. And as far as independent contractor versus employee, I mean, either they're classified properly or they're not. An introductory period will not have an effect on that. Gotcha. All right. Um, this is a labor lawyer geek issue, standing and representation cases. Currently, employers have the right to intervene on who gets to vote and who doesn't. They're looking at eliminating. It'll be the government and a union that affects your rights without your say-so. Intermittent strikes, we've already talked about the quickie strikes. Um, as I mentioned, you know, quickie strikes will become the law. Secondary boycotts, right? Typically now, the National Labor Relations Act prohibits boycotts of a third party. Um, right, basically going after your suppliers, for example, going after your customers, uh, as opposed to going after and, you know, protesting at your place of business. They're looking at making secondary boycotts lawful. Persuader rules, I won't belabor this point. Right now, when you talk to your uh, lawyer about union avoidance issues, that is a protected conversation. Um, if you bring in a third party, then they have to be registered as persuaders with the U.S. Department of Labor, and there are criminal and civil penalties if you bring a third party in to talk to your employees um, without the proper forms being filled out every single year. Um, this looks to undo the so-called attorney advice exemption. Um, they've brought this up repeatedly over the almost 30 years that I've been doing this. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Unless you're in a un active union campaign, it's not going to be an issue for you. This is an issue. They are looking at expanding the National Labor Relations Act to include penalties. Right now, the, uh, the provision, if you violate the rights, for example, I told you my people who wanted to work from home, right? What was the penalty for that? <coughs> well, I mean, ultimately, the NLRB can require us to withdraw the discipline. And if somebody was terminated, they could require reinstatement with back pay. But there's no pain and suffering. There is uh, no fines. There are no penalties. There are no attorney's fees. They're looking at imposing financial penalties and possibly a private cause of action um, for the National Labor Relations Act. A game changer. All right. Um, they're looking at uh, overturning some key NLRB cases. The big one is Purple Communications. Purple Communications says that if you offer people an electronic form of communication, like email, that employees can use your communication systems for union organizing. Um, the Trump board reversed Purple Communications. It's coming back. The board will change over the next four years. Um, we've, already, we've already lost a general counsel. And I anticipate that we will have possibly even a majority of pro-labor Democrats by the end of the first term of the Biden administration. All right, a couple of final things as we sort of come to a close here. Um, what are some things that are going on in Georgia? All right, uh, there's a new law uh, dealing with criminal background checks. Criminal background checks were a big deal during the Obama administration. All right, so Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says that thou shalt not discriminate, right, when it comes to race, color, religion, gender, and national origin. The law generally has, has, has developed this way. African Americans are more likely to have an arrest without a conviction African-American males are more likely to have an arrest without a conviction than, say, Caucasian females. Now, Brittany and Amanda and some of these Hollywood types have been trying to reverse that statistic. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, the idea is that an arrest in America were presumed innocent and uh, an arrest is meaningless. The Obama administration, um, they took the position 
that if a person that a that if African American males are more likely to have an arrest, it therefore follows they're more likely to have a conviction. And so if you use a conviction, it must be narrowly tailored to the job. There's a law, there's a, a case out there called the Green Case. And they basically codified the green factors. What are the green factors? You look at the timing of the offense. You look at the nature of the offense. You look at how the offense relates to the job, right? Congratulations on your parole, Jonathan. We're glad you're rehabilitated from embezzlement. No, you cannot be our new CFO, right? In contrast to, hey, Jonathan, back in 1967, during the summer of love, when you lived on the corner of Hayton Ashbury, the fact that you got busted with a little bit of acid probably doesn't mean a whole lot, right, in 2021, um, 53 years later. Um, and so a lot of states, including, you know, the People's Republic of California, have had what they call ban the box legislation. You can't even ask about criminal background checks. Um, there's at least a Senate bill now that is uh, going to allow rehabilitated um, individuals to petition the court to restrict and seal criminal records and would prohibit the use of an employee's criminal uh, history information uh, against the employee for the employee's actions. I mean, guys, as we go from being a red state to a purple state to some predict one day a blue state, um, and as Metro Atlanta becomes more and more like Metro LA and Metro Manhattan, we're going to see more and more of the same style of legislation that they've had um, in, you know, in New York and on the West Coast. Now, you know, is it going to be vetoed by the governor? Probably, if there's a Republican governor. Um, I mean, part of Georgia's competitive advantage and why businesses are relocating from California and New Jersey and New York to um, the state of Georgia is because our elected leaders have for the most part you know, decided to stay out of the employer-employee relationship. And to the extent it's regulated, it's only regulated by the feds. But you can see um, there's at least some of the state legislation from other parts of the country that is beginning to sneak into the increasingly purple, maybe one day blue Georgia. All right, uh, there's a COVID-19 lawsuit shield for businesses, um, which again, you know, is designed to protect businesses and protect and, and encourage you to bring people back in the fold. That's why all of you have that big sign. Um, and if you don't have the big sign, shoot me an email, I'll get you a copy of the big sign. Non-compete. Um, I've written a law review article for Mercer's Law Review since 2001 on the Georgia law of non-competes. Um, in 2010, there was a game changer. There was a ballot referendum to amend the Georgia Constitution from the time I first started writing the article in 2001 until 2010. I would submit to you that Georgia probably was the hardest place in the United States of America to have an enforceable non-compete. Why? Because our courts have taken the position that Georgia's public policy demands open competition. A non-compete is an inherent restraint on trade. And as a result, they would only enforce them under the very, very, very narrowest circumstances that they had to be very restricted as to time, not more than two years, geography. You had to demonstrate that within that entire 50 mile radius, you were doing business. If your radius didn't go more than 35 miles, well, then guess what? You had 15 miles. I used to do it county by county when I drafted them. Um, and I would require my clients to show me that they actually did business in those counties. Um, and more importantly, that the employee at issue did business in that county. So time, geography, and scope. What does scope mean? The language you can't go work for a competitor was overly broad. That means you can't be the receptionist, you can't be the janitor, you can't be the valet parking guy, right? They had to be narrowly, you cannot go work for a competitor in the exact same capacity as the capacity for which you work for my company. And so they're very difficult to enforce. 
In 2010, they were liberalized through constitutional amendments, and now judges can blue pencil. So if they think the 50 mile rule is overly broad, they can get out their blue pencil and change it to 35 miles. If they think the any capacity clause is overly broad, they can tie, they can pencil in same capacity. Um, obviously, that's made them much more enforceable and inures to the benefit of business. However, I've seen a lot of people who make everyone sign a non-compete. And I think this legislation is designed to, to say, look, if you're making less than $17 an hour, your job is not that important that you need to be prohibited from working for a competitor. All right. Uh, I was given an hour, and as lawyers are prone to do, I've used up almost every last second of my time. I think I'm at 59 minutes, although I'll stick around for a few questions. Um, as you can see, there's a new sheriff in town. Um, our state is changing. There's a lot on the horizon. Um, if I can give you, you know, one, you know, key takeaway, be nice to your folks. Folks, two years ago, there was a study out of the L London School of Economics, and they followed the 100 best employers in the United States of America, not the United Kingdom, not Europe, the United States of America, as per employee surveys, and they followed 27 years worth of data. Now, I'm not a statistician, but that seems to me to be a pretty decent data set. What was their conclusion? When they looked at head-to-head -head competition and the ultimate measure of business success, profitability, they found that employees who liked where they worked, employees who thought that they worked for a great employer, were from 2.8 to 3.6% more profitable every single year than their direct competitors. In one case, over the 27-year period, the one business was 168% more profitable than its direct competitor. It's common sense, folks, right? Employees who know that you care about them, employees who trust their boss, employees who know that their boss follows the golden rule, right? That they put their, them, their employees ahead of themselves. They show up early. They treat your customers well. They give extra, extra customer service. They don't call in sick. They don't show up drunk. They don't maximize their FMLA. They don't hire Mr. One Call, that's all, right? They don't go to Uncle Sam. They don't go to Aunt Georgia, right? And they don't go to the AF of L. Um, they show up, they work hard, and you make a lot of money, and you don't have the aggravation of dealing with management side labor lawyers. Treat your employees well. Let them know that you care. Listen to them. The AFL-CIO's organizing manual tells organizers to follow the 75-25 rule. Listen 75% of the time and talk 25% of the time because the boss usually talks 75% of the time and only listens 25% of the time. And when in doubt, follow your ABCs. Always be consistent. Document everything. And with that, I am officially out of time. Matt, thank you so much for inviting me. Folks, thank you so much for attending. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, there were a couple of questions that came up. One just was a clarification question on the, non, the $17 rule and non-compete. Does that mean if they make less than that, they cannot be subject to non-compete? Correct. That's, that's the proposal. Okay. But it's not, it's not, in, for, it's not in, in, uh, in action now, right? Correct. Yeah, right now it's just a House bill, so it is pending legislation. And if it's something that you don't like, then go talk to your representative and your senator about it. Right. And then the, uh, the $500,000 threshold you talked about, is that uh, gross revenue or is that profit? That is gross revenue. Gross re so if your gross revenue is less than $500,000, uh, then those rules don't apply to you. Oh, good question. And the answer is, and you're going to hate this, it depends. <laughs> <clears throat> And here's why. Under the Fair Labor Standards Act, minimum wage and overtime, the $500,000 threshold is for what they call enterprise liability. Every employee who works at that facility is subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act because you have $500,000 in gross revenues and, right, you have um, interstate commerce. But let, let me tell you, you can have individual liability even if you don't have enterprise liability. 
So let me give you an example. Years ago, I handled a Fair Labor Standards Act case. Um, and the Fair Labor Standards Act case was for a small uh, laundry, right? Um, a dry cleaner. And the people in the back who were washing and folding and ironing and pressing and steaming the clothes, well, they were not covered because the gross revenues were about $300,000 a year. But the lady up front who swiped the credit cards, well, guess what? You know, when you swipe a credit card, what happens? Those electronic signals, mm -hmm. right, cross interstate lines. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they were subject to individual liability and the employer had to go and pay back pay, minimum wage and overtime for the people who were at the front desk because they used telephones and because they used the swipe machine, even though the people wow. in the back washing and folding did not have individual liability. Great question. Yeah. And then uh, just one last question that we'll wrap up is, uh, we also work with a lot of uh, people who, are, who had started a business and they're about to hire their first employee. So what are the uh, you know, two, three, five things that, that, uh, that, that the small business needs to know before they hire that first employee? Okay, a couple of things they need to know before they hire their first employee. Number one, make sure that they keep up with everybody's time records, right? Um, and uh, keep up with their, their hours of work. Um, if I were ever to become a plaintiff's lawyer, the Fair Labor Standards Act is where it's at. Why? Because it applies to small employers and it's the most violated, least understood law. So number one, make sure they keep up with their hours of work. Make sure you pay them properly. Mm -hmm. Avoid independent contractors. Make sure that you fill out the immigration paperwork. Mm -hmm. Just because you are using E-Verify does not mean that you are exempt from filling out the I-9 form. Make sure that you have a policy against harassment and discrimination. Make sure you have a policy, uh, a reporting mechanism, right, for employees who feel like they're the victims of harassment and discrimination. Make sure you've got an open door policy, right? And be nice to your folks. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you know, and if you want a policy, if you want a, you know, a, an anti-discrimination policy, if you want an anti-harassment policy, if you want an open door policy, then shoot me an email. I'll send you a copy free of charge. Um, wow. I mean, look, I'm here to help small businesses. The business community is our, is our life lifeline. It's our bread and butter. Um, you know, I've had people who've helped me throughout my career, and I'm very happy to help other people as they start their business as well. Jonathan, thank you very much. It's been uh, fantastic. And just uh, so people know, this will be available uh, as a recorded webinar on the Chamber website in a couple of days. It'll be posted there. Uh, and uh, we also have been streaming this on Facebook. So there are other, other avenues. So Jonathan, you may be getting some, uh, some follow-up questions or people would rather uh, check with me first. My email is matt.mckenna at scorevolunteer.org. Uh, so you can chat with me and if you're uncomfortable going directly with Jonathan and, and we'll work to get, get your answers. But Jonathan, this has been uh, fantastic, terrific. Uh, you're obviously in a a deep expert in all of this stuff. It's, uh, it's very helpful. So I want to thank, thank you, you very much. Thank your firm very much for allowing us to use this much of your time. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Make, Great American Chamber of Commerce for, for hosting this event. And I hope everybody has a great day and a great week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take Thanks, care. John.